going to walk over there when I talk, just because he set that up that way. Dr. Kara Odom Walker, and I'm the Secretary of Health and Social Services for the state of Delaware. And I welcome all of you to, to this summit where we're going to talk about data analytics and total cost of care. I just wanted to open the day with a, a little bit of history of this location because it is very symbolic of the fact that all of you are coming today on our campus to gather and talk and have a conversation. And this chapel was actually part of a larger campus where people were uh, living and residing as part of the Delaware State Hospital. My office actually is the old administration building and I have this really interesting safe that's in my office where who knows what was in there, right? It, it, it kept all kinds of secrets and probably some cash and a gun and who knows what kind of uh, medicines. But it was a, this was also a working chapel where staff and residents would come and worship and come together to find some peace. The campus probably had about 300 people living here at a time when we really didn't have uh, great medications for people suffering from mental illness, and we have made great strides in medicine today. Um, this achieve the overall outcomes that we anticipate. And I'm just thrilled that um, we're here today with all of you as guests with our live participants. I hope um, people will participate in, in the active live polling that we're doing and also send us questions over Facebook Live. So I'm going to turn the podium over. I get to say a few words of welcome uh, to our moderator, the CEO of the Delaware Health Information Network, Dr. Jan Lee, who is a champion for these issues, whose passion and commitment if you've ever talked to her about what we're doing in Delaware, you know that our data and our uh, effort to make sure that our health information network is truly um, incomparable to other efforts in the country. So thank you, Jan, for being our moderator today. And uh, uh, please come on up. Thank you, Dr. Walker. And thank all of you for your attendance today and for our um, uh, attendees that are joining us online. We wel welcome all of you. Uh, you didn't come to hear me, so uh, my remarks will be quite brief and we will get right into the agenda of the day. First of all, I do want to call your attention to the screens that contain the polling information, and I'm just going to ask if anybody besides me has trouble reading it. <laughs> In case you do, let me, um, let me tell you there are two ways that you can respond to the poll. So if you've got your smartphones, um, you can log in at pollev, P-O-L-L-E-V dot com slash ourhealthde, all smushed together. Or you can text. Uh, the text number is 22333 and the message is ourhealthde. And that will log you in and then you can respond to the poll A, B, or C. Did I get that right? Okay, uh, so with that housekeeping out of the way, um, we are going to hear from a really remarkable set of uh, individuals today, and it's a real privilege for me to be able to introduce them. Uh, we will have a break midway through for lunch. It'll be sort of a networking lunch. Um, we'll want to you know, corral the herd back in pretty promptly so that we can get started with our afternoon speakers and, and finish on time. Uh, so with no further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Robert Brooke, Bob Brooke, uh, holds the Distinguished Chair in Healthcare Services at the Rand Corporation, you might have heard of them, uh, where he previously served for 19 years as Vice President and Director of Rand Health. 
He is also a senior principal physician policy researcher at the RAND Corporation, a professor at the Pardee RAND Graduate School, and professor of medicine and health services at UCLA, where he directs the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program. He led the health and quality group on the $80 million health insurance experiment and was co-principal investigator on the health services utilization study. And he is going to speak to us this morning about the future, redefining healthcare systems and improving health. Thank you so much. Thank, for thank you very us. much. So when Carr asked me to come here <clears throat> to talk in Delaware, I looked at every state in the union in which I had slept in, and the only one I had not slept in was Delaware. So I decided this was an opportunity to finish my bucket list. <clears throat> but more important, um, I know of no other individual that has a moral compass as strong as Carr. And if there's anyone anywhere in the country to try to lead Delaware to a better place when it comes to health and health care, it clearly is her. And um, it's a privilege to try to see if I can help out. But I'm going to do it in a way that's very unorthodox. I'm not going to give you any really specific ways of dealing with costs. Um, there are lots of speakers that are going to do that following me. I'm going to give you some hints on how to do that by setting what you're going to do in the context of what's going to happen in the world. So if I can turn to the next, the first slide, there are three assumptions about the future that you ought to have right now. Next slide. Humans will exist. Um, you can all poll that question, whether you think that exception is correct or not. Uh, number two is most cities won't be underwater. You can poll that question too. Three, that women will not be immortal, therefore men will still exist. <clears throat> um, my belief is that at some point in time, we may have to face all three of those assumptions in a way that we may not really think that they are going to occur today. So let's go on. I'm going to assume, and I'm going to assume that one of the things you ought to do before you redesign the healthcare system in Delaware is every one of you, and I don't have any money in this book, any one of you ought to read this book called Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind. If you like that book, read the next book called Homo Deus, uh, which is the future of the human beings. But you've got to put what you're doing in some context. Why? I've been in the field for 50 years. And if you look at the amount of change that has occurred in 50 years, it's not clear what's going to occur first, that the coastal cities of the United States are going to be underwater, or we actually going to get doctors to wash their hands. It's not clear what's going to occur first. Next slide. Um, so here are the thoughts. No, go back one. Um, what Sapien said is that we are becoming godlike. Uh, we're undecided about what to do, and we have no new vision. And this is the first state that I remember that signed the Constitution. That was a vision of the United States. What's the vision today? When you don't have a vision that unites people, you can become dangerous. And so one of the things that you could do over health and health care is provide a new vision. And wouldn't it be neat if one of the smallest states in the country could actually do that? Next slide. Now, what is Cara's role as head of the state health department, or whatever her title really is? So that's one way of looking at it out of a book about what is the function of a rabbi, or does she have some other function? Is this her role? I'll give you a second to read it. Okay, next slide. So what do I want in terms of health? If you want something that's free, you can read something, get it from Amazon.com or anywhere else it's free or RAND, but you can download it for free. But I'm going to talk to you a little bit about this for a few minutes and then we'll get off the stage. Next slide. Okay, will basic science make us all immortal or do we have to eliminate the social determinants of health? Um, you will hear a lot as you redesign healthcare and redistribute money. What you're all about when you talk about controlling money in any sector of health or healthcare is redistributing it. 
to something else. Um, you're taking it away from one group of people, you're putting it and giving it to somebody else. Um, there's a battle going on right now about how fast basic science is going to change everything versus how fast we have to really eliminate the social determinants. You have to decide in that battle how you're going to distribute money. The next side. We need a movement to do multiple things at once. I'm going to suggest to you that you have to do a large number of things at once. Instead of arguing about doing one thing and nothing else, one thing will make very little difference, no matter what that one thing is. Almost any one thing you can think about that's imaginable will make very little difference. We need a movement to do multiple things at once. Go on. And it has to come from the people. If you can't get the people of Delaware to buy into this with the government and the health professionals, it ain't going to happen. It's got to be done in what I would call a community participatory way where people are buy into this. It can't come from the top. It can't come from the bottom. It has to be both from the bottom up and the top down. You've got to actually make this a people movement to make the kind of change that is needed. Next slide. So first of all, if I was judging progress in this state, everyone must have insurance. Except Bill Gates and you know Warren Buffett. They don't need insurance. They can pay for health care when something happens to them. Everyone else needs insurance. Next slide. You need to simplify the health care system and billing costs. What if in two years there were no more bills? No more bills. Thirty years ago, the Hartford Foundation came this close to making that happen in the state of Washington. It's technically feasible to eliminate all the billing in health care. It can be done. What if Delaware is the first state that did it? What if you went to the national bodies and said, we're going to be the beta lab to make that happen? No more bills. Next slide. What if we pay for only care that is effective and based on evidence? Not because some guru said to do it, but we, the people, the people said that if we want to have health and we want to be healthy, we don't want care that's not effective or not based on evidence. We don't, the people. Not led by the profession, but led by the people. What if that happened? What if you had a marker that answered that question in the next couple of years? Go on. What if people must be responsible and seek out preventive care and take their medicine? What if people demanded that everyone get their flu shot, that everyone get their mammogram? What if this was not a professionally driven movement, but a people driven movement? Could you switch this around in a state like Delaware and make it happen? What are the consequences for not doing it? Consequences can't only fall on some sort of people. Everyone has to participate if we want to be able to have enough resources to do the things we want to do in producing health and health care. Next slide. What if we work together to build a healthy environment and reduce social isolation? There's good data now that says you are healthier if you make somebody else healthier as opposed to yourself. So if you spend your whole life in a gym doing yoga, exercising, that's great. But you're much healthier if you help somebody else do that. What if we developed an environment in the state to do that? Next. What if we accept the notion that some effective and costly care cannot be covered by insurance? What if we all agree that there are things that are too expensive to do? When uh, we did the D-Day invasion of Europe, Eisenhower, when he was talking to FDR, could not take every dollar that was made in the world to use in that invasion. Couldn't have it all. We're going to have to get to the point, at some point, of knowing that we can't have it all if some of it is just absolutely too expensive to have. Next. What if we require parents? You want to do something practical? 
What if tomorrow, in the state of Delaware, you didn't reimburse any family practitioner or pediatrician for a visit by a child unless the child produced their school report card? Since education is going to determine the health of the child much more than probably what the doctor or nurse practitioner is going to do, what if you flip tomorrow this and said, let's make this happen next? What if you urge patient, pa parents, what if doctors and health care to demand weekly feedback from their children's school about whether they missed the class, didn't turn in an assignment, or failed an assignment? You got all these smartphones that are taking pictures and doing this. Everyone has them. Why don't we have a system right now that combines, break down the silos between education and health and realize that there's simple, inexpensive things that we can do right now. Why don't we do it? What I'm saying is not pick one, and you don't need to look at this list. You may have a far better list than I have. You probably all do. But the problem is we need a lot of things to happen at once, and we need a movement to make that happen. Otherwise, we're not going to get very far. Next. What if we do not work in any health system that does not know the following? Go on. How many people it serves? I mean, I can't get most hospital administrators to answer the question, how many people do they serve? I mean, even a health plan doesn't know that. How many people died in the last 24 hours? Don't you think you should know that? I mean, next. How many people died of good death? I mean, wouldn't it be neat if you just tracked the number of people in, in, uh, in Delaware that died in a nursing home and spent more than six months there uh, in their lab, just published it? And the goal is to eliminate it to zero. The health status of those who are alive. Nobody knows that. Next. And does not want and does not work to do something to affect the social determinants of health. What are they going to do in a health system that will change, that will break down the silo and do something to change the social determinants of health? What if all the health systems in Delaware actually did that? What if the whole state did that? Next. We need disruptive change. Go on. What if health included a measure of hate and intolerance? And the head of this, in the chapel when we walked in today, there was a sign that said, everyone that came in for this meeting is interested in improving your health. And you can't be intolerant of people by race, gender, sexual orientation, and be healthy. And we're here to help you, and we're trained, and we know how to do it. What if Delaware became the first state in the union that everyone that was in the health business had that sign on their door? What would it do to health care costs, to health? What would it do? Next. And every health had a sign. I told you that. Let's go on. We integrated measurements of health status into the health system and paid attention to loneliness, social isolation, and despair. Go on. We eliminated differences in quality of care. Go on. We educated people in school and providers and gave them smart decision tools. You can't have consumers being informed and do something and people being informed. What if you change the materials in elementary school? 20% of the economy or more is health. They get no information about health as opposed to how to have sex or not. They get nothing else. They know nothing about how to use the health system, what doctors are, what quality of care is, how it varies, what the cost of care is, what they don't know, what they should demand. They don't get any of this. How to use a website. What if you change the education of kids in school? Next. What if you're going to talk about it? Cit cities and individuals have trusted analytical tools that allow people to thrive. Next. We eliminate the effect of geography on everything. You're very worried that you're more expensive than everybody else. We do that all. I keep believing that the basic science of medical education should be geography, not, not anatomy or histology, just geography. Next. We talked about social determinants go on. I want to try to get you back on schedule. We, we dramatically altered how care is delivered to achieve value and control costs. Go on. We demanded that academic medical centers or your boards that elect doctors in the state of Delaware educate doctors for value-based culture. No doctor is selected or educated to produce value. 
just as it happens, not on the agenda. That, not their goal. It's not the goal, as far as I can tell, of health plans or health administrators either. Maybe there's some push to improve quality, but not any improvement, not much to do with value. Next. And all new policies were evaluated whether they reduce variation in health. Two ways to evaluate the success of the government. One is, does everybody, does health go up? And two, what the variation in health is. Now, keep one more slide, I think, and then we're finished. Uh, last but not least, be humble is not about you. Now, I did something that you're not, you know, I just tried to say to you, have a vision as you go about redistributing this money. I absolutely believe, otherwise I would be here, that what a small state in the United States, given our constitution of the difference between states and the federal government and authority, that a small state is going to become the beta site to do everything at once. Not just one thing. Why not Delaware? Why not this state as opposed to any other state? that will say, how do I put this all together? And then I bet you, you could achieve national funding, not from the federal government, from a lot of wealthy people, foundations, and other places, to actually try to do all this at once. But you're going to really have to work on how you deal with redistributing funds into a way that promotes all of this activity. It's not going to be easy, as you know. There are lots of speakers that are going to give you analytical tools to help you do it better and easier. But the goal is you need a vision at the front of what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I will end with one story. Um, I would like to know the proportion of all the stuff that we pay for that is totally wasted. What do I mean by waste? that is thrown into the garbage can and not used on patients. Just waste it. There's some data that suggests in the hospital that it may be up to 50% of everything is waste. That's a lot of money. So as you think about making the changes and using these tools, think about collecting information, doing things that might be very different from what can be done only with secondary data, but can be done if you all cooperate. Um, I'll end with one example about primary care. Um, nobody, um, Adam Smith did not decide that doctors needed to see patients one right after the other. Didn't, nobody said that they had to do that. So one practice in, in the Northwest decided that a doctor would step out after, a, after they saw a patient and then have a series of little dots of things to do. And one of those dots was to call somebody that had called him. So you pick up the phone in the morning, your child is ill, and you want to talk to the child's doctor, and instead of saying they'll call you back sometime in the near future, they say the doctor is seeing a patient, and just like Hertz or Avis, we will have the doctor will finish in five minutes and you will be able to see, uh, you will be, you'll get a call back from your doctor in five minutes. Doctor steps out in five minutes, calls you back. What happens? Well, in the practice, which they followed it, 85% of the calls to the practice disappeared. 85%. Satisfaction went up. People got home earlier. Doctors made more money. The only people that lost were the people that answered the phone. Mm -hmm. And they were let go. So when you start changing the distribution of what you pay for, some people are going to lose their jobs and they need to be retrained. And that's going to be a big problem. But on the other hand, maybe we can do it in a constructive way that makes health and healthcare better for everyone. And I really believe that a small state like Delaware can actually lead the nation in being the place that everyone will visit in the world. Everyone will visit here in the world because you've got it right. So it was my pleasure coming here and I'm really interested in listening to all the other people that will follow to help you actually do the nuts and bolts better than what I have told you how to do. Thank you.
to open it for um, 10 to 15 minutes worth of Q&A. Uh, I will ask uh, that you please repeat the questions for the benefit of those that okay. are listening live so that uh, they understand what question you're answering, but we throw it open to the audience. Yes. My question is, um, thanks, thanks so much for coming. Um, do you have any examples of other states in your experience that are doing portions of what you described today and that expected to change? Are there examples of states that have pieces, pieces of what you described? Uh, that's a hard question because um, I would want to uh, answer that question by collecting some data. So the answer is I have not done that in collecting that data to answer your question. There are states that have tried to um, uh, do uh, things such as, let me, let me just stop there. The answer is I don't think so. And I think that the problem has been that we haven't gotten the people really on the side of what we're trying to do. And so we have this fight between um, um, Let's take the example of appropriateness of care. 30 years ago, we knew how to measure appropriateness of care. We knew that a large percentage of care was equivocal. Um, I actually went before a number of national physician organizations with all the data and said, if you support a mechanism to make the health professionals accountable for the elimination of equivocal or inappropriate care, and I don't mean costly care, but care that the health benefit does not exceed the health risk. You can take control of the health care system. There'll be very little incentive for a lot of for-profit health plans to come into the game. Came very close for them to decide to do that. They decided not to do it. Um, maybe now, 20 years later, it's time to reopen those kinds of discussions and see if the people and the health professionals and people interested in health and health care can come together to do this. Um, I don't know anyone that's tried to deal with the hate and intolerance idea, which um, I think is the root cause. If you ask me what's going to make it likely that the United States will be a place that um, uh, we would want to all live, I think it's when people involved in health and health care are going to say that part of our job is to make us a more tolerant nation. I mean, um, some of the professional societies have spoken up recently, but um, I really do believe that one of the questions we ought to be doing is thinking, how do we do that? How do we educate everyone that is involved in patient care into increasing tolerance? So I'll leave it at that. Experience. Um, I ran the coronary artery bypass surgery reporting uh, system for the state of California. So, if you want some real practical experience, so um, California um, has 131 institutions that do coronary artery bypass surgery. Um, the price varied all over the lot, just like anybody would imagine. Um, the, there was no state law that said um, you need to have transparency in data. Um, but a business group got together called the Pacific Business Group on Health, and they called up 15 or 20 prominent cardiac surgeons and asked them to come to a meeting. And they said, we have data how much you're charging us to do bypass surgery. And um, it varies threefold. I mean, not 5%, threefold. Um, why should we pay you if you are three times as expensive? And the answer was, of course, we produce a better quality product. And the business group said, well, how do I know that? 
and because I told you was the response of the cardiac surgeons. <laughs> and the business group said, that's not good enough. What if we paid the business group to develop a system to see if the death rate varies by cardiac surgeon in the state of California or hospital? Would you collect and submit your data? And the cardiac surgeons in the room said yes. Part of the chair, I was chair of the committee on the health services researcher, not a cardiac surgeon, I'm an internist. And the first year around, only 30 or 40 docs or places put their data into place. And we looked at it, and there was variation. And they published it, and it was transparent. But then we added one line in the report, just one line. The re line in the report that I suggested was, why don't we say that, yes, there's variation here, but we don't know anything about everyone else that hid their data, and we would encourage you to at least go to places where the data was transparent. Um, within a year, everybody was playing in the data set. And the state eventually took it over, and right now in the state of California, there's absolutely no variation, none, in by hospital or virtually by doctor in the death rate from getting a coronary artery bypass surgery. That's a huge state. Uh, the death rate over 10 years fell by from three and a half or four percent or something to one and a half percent. And there's no variation. I talked about variation. There's none. So these things can be done. The problem is it's only one thing. It's not everything. We just did one thing. And we didn't ask the question of whether it's appropriate to do the coronary artery bypass surgery, which is a question that might be the first question you might be interested in. So we didn't ask that question. And it took a lot of work to do one thing. The question for me is how do you get all of this together and do more than one thing if you're really going to change the system? So when you ask the question, individual states have done little things in transparency and data. And generally, that has been well received. It's just that they've only done you know, one thing at a time and not many things together. It's time for everyone to sort of do all of it together. Now, um, the, the other question is, what's, why don't doctors know when they go home how much they spent that day? I mean, when I go home after practicing a day in the clinic, why don't I know what I spent. Why don't, why don't I get any feedback about cost on a real-time basis? Can you develop really real-time systems to change the entire feedback mechanism in the state to do this? And can you do it in a way that I would call um, um, uh, um, gentle? Um, I, I am for making this change occur. Uh, but can't we figure out how to do it and treat each other with dignity and respect in doing it? That, to me, is the key here. Both people treating people and treating health professionals and treating the government, government officials. And when we go into this ch change mode, somebody has to be evil. And I don't think we can get anywhere if um, either the health professionals are evil, the hospital administrators are evil, the business people are evil, government's evil, people are evil. People, you know, just uh, want to be freeloaders, whatever the words are. We need to figure out a, a moral compass that gets us all together to do something. That, to me, is the key to making substantial change in what we're doing. I don't know whether that can happen. The other issue is to break down silos. Um, I, I do not believe that um, any longer we can separate out um, all the functions of government from the silos that we grew up with because they're so interrelated. We got to break them all down, and we got to say we're really interested in making human beings thrive. That's the role of state government. How do we figure out how to do it with the budget that we have to make it happen? That's the goal. Other questions? Can you just comment a little bit more on how you made the information public um, your breast surgery registry? So you say you made it public. How did that happen? Uh, we published it. We put it on the website. State of California put it on the website. Uh, we invited reporters to come in to the uh, uh, the meetings. The meetings were all public. 
um, in California, all the meetings were public. Um, so all the discussions of the committee were public. We had a court reporter that I'm not sure nobody ever read it, but would sit there and you know, spend eons you know, copying every word down we said for a whole day meeting. And um, that's how we did it. Well, what, was the, uh, what was the nature, especially early on, the pushback from large provider systems to the state politically in terms of disposing of that? Well, the, the pushback, um, it, what was really interesting is that, um, um, and maybe it's just cardiac surgeons, but the cardiac surgeons are so, uh, uh, I mean, I, I guess if you go into a operating room and stop a person's heart, cut out a vessel and put a new vessel in, or uh, you got to have a lot of self-confidence. Uh, you can't be like an internist who's scared of blood. I mean, you really have to. You really have to have a uh, an ego. And um, so, you know, once we got a few of them to agree that this was okay, they they were they were comfortable with it. And the really interesting question is that at the end, when we looked at the changes that people made, um, I'll give you one example that came up. Um, and, and these were open forums between the doctors and the committee. So one of the doctors got up and said, um, um, my death rate was higher because I operate on Jehovah's Witnesses. And, and you know they don't take blood. And so a couple of them died from low hemoglobins. And um, so my patients ought to be excluded and I should not get a bad star. And I didn't, I'm not a health services researcher, intern, I didn't know what to do with that. But on either side of me were two surgeons, and they looked at the surgeon who they knew, and they said straight out to him, well, I do the same thing. If you feel uncomfortable operating on Jehovah's Witnesses, send them to me. I will be happy to do it, because I don't have that kind of problem. I know how to do much the surgery that is more bloodless than that. And that ended that conversation. Uh, so, but we did find things with the feedback that resulted us in changing things. There were legitimate reasons to change things. But it really was a, co a combined activity to, to make this happen. That um, is what, now, um, one of the real problems is you run into small numbers. And one of the issues when Delaware tells me that they're highest on something, cost of care, violence, or whatever, you know, the only places that you can be either very high or very low is when you're small. If you're a big state, a big area, you gotta be very close to the mean. Just by math, you know, it's very rare that you find big places that are very deviant. Mathematically, you've got to be at the top, you've got to be small. And so one of the real questions is how to do with small numbers and how to make it fair for people that only operate on 25 or 30 people or have small, how do you, how do you make it fair for small people? How do you do that? And, that's, and that requires wisdom, thought, and some you know, tough decisions. You can't be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. I think we have one more question over here and then we'll have to move on. I was wondering if you could clarify a little more about what exactly you mean by uh, total cost of care. You sort of talked about uh, cost from the perspective of the health care provider, health care administrator, internal cost. Talked about uh, healthcare just spending, uh, and talk a little bit about social spending, from social programs, uh, and then there are also just the non financial cost. And so, if we're trying to reduce costs overall, what exactly do we mean by cost? Uh, so that, you know, whatever we decide to implement, once we implement it, how does those impact you? Well, you really, that's a good question. And the question is, what are you trying to do? If you're the Congressional Budget Office, you're trying to control expenditures, which is another concept of cost, different means different than cost, expenditures on Medicaid and Medicare that the federal government expends. That's what you're trying to do. If you are um, a person, what would I, if I'm a person in Delaware, I want to have some money left over from the amount of money that I earn on my paycheck to do something other than pay for health care, I think. 
Um, if healthcare was the most effective, efficient thing, that may not be true. I might be willing to work my entire life just to pay for healthcare. But you probably want to have to do something else with the money. Um, as you know, that um, when your health premiums go up, um, the way you're, it's a trade-off for wages. So when an employer looks at trying to hire somebody, they don't ask the question, how much am I spending on health care versus wages? They ask the question, how much is the total package that I have to pay for this person? So as health care goes up, then, then um, other things go down. And I'll give you one example of this. Um, I was um, talking in Oregon years ago during the recession that all the timber, probably before many, many of you were born, when all the timber prices went down to nothing. And the head of the Appropriations Committee in Oregon was very conservative. And I was sitting next to him at lunch, and I had never met the man. And I turned to him, and I was there to lead a conversation, and I said, I'm Robert Brooke, I'm a physician. And we were eating steak. He took his steak knife, and he was going to stick it in my chest and started screaming at me. Uh, I mean, my first job was to actually take the knife from my jacket, and the second job was to sort of say, everyone was stunned, the room became quiet. Why did he do this? Well, he had voted against his political philosophy two years earlier because the state was in such dire needs to raise the amount of money that was given to poor people or disadvantaged people, and because people didn't have food and housing. And he was telling me that I, as doctors, you guys, two years later, came back and everyone was still poor and had no food and no housing because all the money was spent on increases in medical care. And his statement to me, from his perspective, was we allocated all this state money to do this and you guys, when the, when the recession occurred, couldn't even figure out how to control the amount of money you spent on health care. You just used it all up, and you didn't care whether all these other people, you know, didn't have housing or food or anything else. So if you ask me the question on how much money I would want to spend on health care, I think um, clearly we can't spend every dollar that we make in the United States on health care. And when I talk about total cost, I'd like to know all the money that's spent on health care. And I would like to know that it is in some uh, relationship to um, what we want to do, what the opportunity costs are to do with it if we use it in some other way. I would be much happier spending more money on health care if people would convince me that all the money being spent on was extraordinarily effective and cost effective. So uh, before you get into the total cost issue, I think there's an enormous amount of room to, without worrying about eliminating costly care at this moment, to make the system efficient. But that's going to take time. It's going to take a number of years to make that happen. So that's how I'd answer the question. Um, thank you, Dr. Brooks. We are going to have to move on. Uh, thank you very much. Our next speaker is um, Arielle Mir. Uh, she's the Director of Communications at NUNA, and prior to joining NUNA, she was the Assistant Director of the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, MedPAC. Uh, she led the Commission's Congressional Liaison, External Affairs, and Press Work. She was awarded the Presidential Management Fellowship in 2007 and served at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Ariel earned her MPA from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton University, and we're delighted to hear from her today on the vendor's view of data platforms and analytics. Welcome. Thank you so much, Jan. It's really an honor to be invited to participate in this exciting and really important event today. Congratulations to you, to Secretary Walker, Governor Carney, and everyone here for the efforts that Delaware is making to improve healthcare in the first state through greater transparency and accountability. 
As a professional, I'm accustomed to these types of public forums. I spent most of a decade working for a commission that advises the US Congress on many of these same issues and deliberated on them in public. About two and a half years ago, I switched roles and became part of a technology team that works with public and private healthcare payers to help them leverage their data to improve care and enable greater accountability. Next slide. With my time, I want to do three things today. First, I want to do a quick introduction to our company, Nuna. Second, I'll share a case study with you of some work that Nuna did for the federal government, for CMS, to bring data together to create a global view of healthcare in the Medicaid program. And last, I'll offer a few reflections on how these types of data efforts can be implemented to create value for all stakeholders involved. Next slide. So Nuna was founded by Jeannie Kim, an alumna of Google and one of the tech folks who was brought in to fix healthcare.gov when it was on fire and the website wasn't working. Remember that? Um, she's there in the red. As a little girl, and um, Jeannie's brother Kimon, who's in the blue shirt, her younger brother, he has struggled with autism and epilepsy his entire life since he was a child. And um, his condition is so severe, he's almost completely nonverbal. The only words that Kimon has are the Korean words for mom and dad and sister, and the Korean word for sister is Nuna, that's how our company got its name. Jeannie's family experiences in the healthcare system were tumultuous. It took 20 years to get his epilepsy under control. At nine years old, Jeannie signed came on up for Medicaid. Her parents didn't speak English, they were immigrants to this country. And, and it was those experiences that inspired her, inspired her to found this company, right, and to join efforts to improve our healthcare system, right, for Kimong and for, for Americans everywhere. So we are a technology, Nuna is a technology company. Next slide, please. Nuna is a technology company. We're based in San Francisco. We thrive on multidisciplinary collaboration, right? It's not just a tech company full of engineers and, uh, and software developers, right? It's engineers working with data scientists, healthcare economists, statisticians, policy experts, and designers, all who work hand in hand to produce solutions that drive improvements in care and enable greater accountability in the healthcare system. Next slide. So it's no surprise to me that a recurring theme in the forums we've had here in Delaware has been about data. The promise of better care, delivery system reform, relies on data and data systems. So often the policy ideas that we've come up with um, at MedPAC, uh, working for the Congress, hit a wall when they got to the administration and had to be implemented because the data systems couldn't do what we were asking them to do. So what will it take to measure total healthcare spending, total healthcare costs in Delaware in a meaningful way? Well, for one, it's going to mean it's going to require bringing, dis bringing disparate streams of data together into one place. And to shed light on some of the ways this effort could be set on the right path, I want to share a case study, our experience, Nuna's experience, building the first ever standardized data warehouse for the Medicaid program. So why, why is Medicaid a good analogy for Delaware, right? So Delaware's a small state, but despite that, there's a variety of healthcare payers. You have commercial carriers, you have the state and the state employee programs, Medicare, Medicaid, VA, et cetera. Right? And each of those entities has their own data, different formats, different fields, different time frames. Right? And similarly, Medicaid is not monolithic. Right? Unlike fee-for-service Medicare, which is administered in a relatively uniform way across the country, Medicaid is effectively 56 different programs. I don't know if you have 56 different payers in Delaware, but uh, in Medicaid it's 56, right, with different eligibility rules, different data systems. And in the 50 years since the Medicaid program was founded, it had never had a standardized data system. Next slide, please. So for those of you who haven't been involved with Medicaid data systems for the last few decades, I'll give you the Cliff's Notes version. On the one hand, it's, one, it's outdated technology and also unanswerable questions. And so it wasn't until 1999 that CMS actually required states to submit data from their Medicaid programs. And they did so by mailing tapes, like the ones you see on this slide, uh, into the, uh, up to Baltimore to, to Medicare, uh, to CMS. And some did so that way until 2009. They were mailing those tapes. Right? It was a legacy data system called Emsys, and it was built like much of the world's enterprise software to be run on mainframes, like these massive, really expensive computers, 
program with language that was developed in the 1960s. And, right, not only does that, I mean, at, back at my office in San Francisco, like, old technology just, like, offends my colleagues, right? <laughs> but it's not just that it's not, you know, it's not new and hip, right? The outdated technology makes everything slower. Transmitting the data, loading the data was slow, right, which made it nearly impossible to identify and address data quality issues in any reasonable time frame. And of course, it delayed, the, it delayed using the data for analytics. Okay. So you couldn't monitor the program in any real-time manner. Forget about total cost of care. On any one day, you couldn't know how many people were in any game. You, couldn't, you literally couldn't get a good enrollment count at any one time. One of my favorite anecdotes, oh, we're still on the, on the previous slide, I'm sorry. One of my favorite anecdotes uh, comes from a friend who was the chief medical officer for Medicaid down at CMS. And when he started the job in 2012, he asked his staff, can you give me a list on the top 10 diagnoses among Medicaid beneficiaries by frequency and by expenditure, right? Pretty simple, you know, pretty simple question. Start to understand what kinds of challenges uh, he had to take on. And basically they said no, right? They had some data, but it was from 2007. That was the freshest data. And it was for fee-for-service Medicaid only, right? So, so effectively unanswerable question. Next slide, please. So enter Nuna, right? That's Jeannie and Kimong uh, this year in our offices. Um, so Nuna take on, took on the, a renewed Medicaid data platform project called TMSIS, the Transformed MSIS. We started in 2014. And now it has almost 95% of Medicaid covered lives in it. And it's on its way, it's not perfect, right? But it's on its way to being a foundation for improvements in how care is delivered in Medicaid. Next slide. So what matters in the data platform when you're bringing together these disparate teams of data? What are the characteristics of TMSIS that could be useful in guiding Delaware's process? So I'm going to speak to these qualities um, on the next several slides, right? Security, it's power and flexibility, it's uh, sustainable costs, as well as sensitivity to the processes that are already in place in the state. So a corner system of a powerful data system is the technology used to build and to host it. So one of the innovations that we brought to this TMSIS project is the use of the consumer cloud, cloud um, uh, for hosting the system, as CMS now does through Amazon Web Services, right? So basically, the concept of the cloud, if you don't know already, is that instead of buying and storing your data on our own computers, we basically rent out other people's really powerful computers only when we need it. So how does this benefit the Medicaid program? Well, one, the cloud is flexible, right? So for, over the course of any one month, there are points in time when you need a lot of computing power. When we bring the data in, when you're, um, when someone does a massive query of data, you might want hundreds of CPUs for that work, and the rest of the time, it's idle. In an old enterprise data center, you used to wait weeks to expand, expand your cluster's capacity on the racks, like these little racks of servers. Right now, you can expand the capacity in seconds and expand it only for the time you need it. Right? And the faster that the data is processed, the faster the data is available for use in analysis. Right? So this stuff really matters in terms of um, the, uh, our ability to get the data and use it for the, for the mission that we have. In a traditional data center, you pay based on the maximum computing power that you need. Right? And so you estimate your peak load, and then you pay for that for the entire year. In a cloud-based system, you pay only for what you use, which ends up being less expensive for more power when you need it. Along with power, along with power and efficiency, the cloud is better protected, right? No single project, no single data warehouse will ever invest the millions of dollars that Google or Amazon or Microsoft does in their data centers on security alone, right? From the armed guards all the way down to the auditing controls, right? And in a system like this, everyone can leverage and benefit from the economies of scale, right, of these massive shared infrastructure. Next slide, please. So as challenging as the technology piece is, right, and it's not, it's not simple, um, as important to the success of a data platform and bringing the data together from disparate sources is what is done to co coordinate people and processes. Right, the task of aggregating standardizing data involves a huge, it affects a huge number of individuals and processes, right, and a fair number of pain points, 
all the different payers, all their different schedules, all their different systems. So I want to share with you a few examples of some of the tools that we use to build Tamsys to support this element of the project, right? To really enable the stakeholders to do what they needed to do to be successful. Right, so next slide, please. So uh, I'll talk first about file submission, right? Prior to Tamsys, data submissions were tracked liberally by hand. So if a state wanted to answer the simple question of whether their files that they had submitted had been received and successfully processed, they needed to call someone on the phone or send an email or wait for periodic status reports. Right now, states, so our, our stakeholders submitting the data and CMS always know where the data is. They have a single source of truth, this operations dashboard, this is one of the views, um, that shows the status of the data as soon as the files have been uploaded, right? So it's like tracking a package that you order and uh, is being delivered to your house by UPS. The next screenshot, next slide please, shows how you can drill down within an operations dashboard like this to debug the data errors, right? So the red highlighted field shows where there's an error occurred and you can even see the raw data that was submitted that caused a problem. Right? Prior to this, the feedback loop was way too slow. Right? In order to get an analyst to validate the data from the state, it took months. And by the time the states learned of the details of what the problem was, they would already moved on to submitting the next quarter's data. Right? So the resources it took to get the data in the form that you needed to do anything with it were tremendous. Right? So now, states and CMS can discuss and correct problems in days instead of months. Right? With data quality reports and dashboards like this one, both states and CMS can see which data rules were triggered and which rec records were causing problems. On this slide, I've listed just a handful of features that we implemented to improve workflow and collaboration, right? As I said, this means bringing together a huge number of stakeholders, right, who all have their particular ways of doing something, right? Coordinating across, across a range of entities like this requires culture change. Right? Each entity wants to go at their own pace in their own way. Right? And you can use technology to support this kind of change and to invest in creating new kinds of relationships and building trust among the stakeholders who are coming together to be part of this project. Right? And it's this kind of collaboration that increases transparency in the process, not just the data. Right? And it can make implementation of various program design elements easier. So for example, uh, in working on TMSYS, we used um, Confluence, which is kind of a, like a Wikipedia page, an internal Wikipedia page, right, that contains all of the information about the project that anyone can access at any time, right? So uh, on our Wikipedia page, on our wiki page for TMSYS, there's the data dictionary, right? So everyone can know at any time, um, you know, all the different specifications for each data field, right? In Delaware, you could use a similar, um, a similar concept to um, increase transparency among stakeholders about the different specifications for a total cost of care measure, right? How the risk adjustment might be done is about price standardization, right? Anything that might be complicated or controversial or you know require some time for people to digest, placing it in a central location um, and facilitating tools so that people can ask questions and communicate um, can really uh, can really drive the process forward. And, uh, Next slide. So what does all this technology and collaboration tools and dashboards, operations dashboards get you? Well, once you've assembled the data, right, now in a much, in a much quicker manner, right, it can be used to understand, to monitor, and, uh, um, and, um, and to be applied to the policies and programs that you have to improve care. Right? At a most basic level, it can be used to create analytic reports. I realize these are small. Right? These are some of the basic dashboards we built for CMS that were just about enrollment. Right? Trends in uh, different demographic groups, uh, by, uh, by delivery system, named care, etc. Right? And there's so many more ways you could slice this data in a basic way. you looking at utilization, care pathways, quality, and more. Right? And these, um, you know, these these kinds of dashboards can be the basis for, um, for public reporting and transparency in the state, as well as to help lay the foundations for future payment reforms to drive greater accountability in the system. Right? And with timely, cleaner data, the systems can go well beyond these basic analytics, right? To do predictive analytics, machine learning, to start to anticipate before things happen, whether it's program integrity, whether it's quality issues, 
um, you know, to start to have some sense that of, you know, of, of what's developing in the program and to use the data in a more sophisticated way than ever before. Next slide. Now, it, it would be short-sighted and kind of unfair of me to end this discussion without acknowledging where Medicaid and, uh, and Delaware may differ somewhat. Right, so for one, the governance structure is different. CMS was able to corral all the parties, in part due to the fact that they had some statutory authority to enable them to require the compliance with the structure and the process of the data submission. Right? They could impose a common data dictionary, right, which was one of the keys to having a unified data structure. Like states didn't have a ton of leverage in the process, right? some, but, but not, and in fact, the Affordable Care Act provides for the authority for CMS to withhold funds that didn't submit data correctly, right? And so, as I understand the environment in Delaware, the governance and the incentives are somewhat different, right? And so to design a system that can make the most impact, that can, in, in, uh, that can involve um, the greatest number of stakeholders, right, with the, you know, with the greatest potential to improve care, it will require some further thought. So, next slide, thanks. Um, what I'll offer as one way of thinking about this challenge is a reflection both drawn from Nuna's work on Medicaid as well as some of the work that our office has done actually with, um, with Craig Jones's colleagues at ONC. And that's about changing our mindset around data warehouses, right? So, uh, so from moving from this idea of a data vault, right, to real value, right? So the question of how do we avoid creating yesterday's all-payer all claims data, I almost said your mother's all player better claims data, but now that I'm a mom, <laughs> I don't like to use those terms. But yesterday's all player claims data, right, or data vault, in which data goes in, but then never again sees the light of day, right? Um, I believe that this is closely linked with how we think about the stakeholders who submit data to the systems. What if, next slide please, what if the stakeholders who traditionally sit, submit data to these kinds of repositories storing cross-pay or even cross-provider claims data are not just seen as data producers, but also data consumers, right? Not simply parties to convince or coerce to share their data, but stakeholders who stand to benefit from a collective effort to aggregate, organize, and make this data valuable for improving healthcare in Delaware, right? Just like when the states moved over to a new Medicaid data system, right, there's gonna be costs to conforming to the new structures and systems that will be implemented in Delaware. And if the benefit is all a one-way street, that kind of cooperation may feel out of reach, right? Yet the promise of a shared resource, right, in which all can benefit, stakeholders and then, you know, and then of course patients down, down the line, with access to billing data, potentially other forms of data down the line, right, may make the cost of participation seem less onerous, right? If there's a benefit, it's a lot easier to show up and do something different. So along those lines, I'll share one last example from Medicaid. Actually, I spent most of this talk focusing on TMSIS, right, so the data platform that holds, among other things, the claims and encounter data for Medicaid. But TMSIS isn't the whole story either. With the Medicaid data, uh, uh, the real value of a system like TMSIS is actually borne out when it's brought to life for all the stakeholders and combined with other types of data, so program data, financial data, et cetera. Right? And the vision for that is being built out in a, in a broader data warehouse that we're also helping to build at CMS called the Medicaid and CHIP Business Information Solution, or MACBiz, love their acronyms there. Right? And it's an enterprise resource, a shared resource that over time will benefit not just CMS who build the system, but states and other authorized data users. Right? When you build systems like this, right, you can benefit from modern software for data provisioning and managing and management, right, which can make the analytics more robust, way faster, and less expensive for everyone involved. So we'll end there. Um, on a note of optimism, right, it's, it's clear Delaware is on the right track, right, with thoughtful policy leadership, a strong foundation with the Delaware Health Information Network, and with the right technology and tools built around the needs of all the stakeholders involved, I, I believe Delaware will be well positioned to make good on its goals. Thank you. And again, we can take uh, about uh, 10, 15 minutes worth of questions, and if you wouldn't mind repeating the questions okay. so the people on our listening audience will understand what's being asked. Maybe expand a little on some of the use cases at CMS, how, how they're going to go about using the system 
kind of think of how they envision um, the learning network, if you will, that translate with their finding back to states. How's that network you know, Yeah, absolutely. So um, <laughs> I mean, as I said, some of the you know when we when we took on some of the work of building the analytic dashboards for CMS, we expected things that were pretty sophisticated. And sitting down with the staff, you know, initially, like their first questions were really about enrollment, right? Trying to understand um, the the diversity in the types of individuals enrolled in Medicaid, the participation in managed care. <coughs> income levels, just to really start to understand, you know, to answer like some of the most basic questions um, that they use when they develop uh, rulemaking, um, that they use to guide their quality improvement efforts, right? So, um, you know, because CMS has this kind of governing view, but, um, you know, all of the implementation happens in, in conjunction with the states. Um, you know, you know. Often, what they do is the framework to enable states to move forward. Um, the data uh, can also be used to inform some of the state innovation models, right? So, um, there's a lot of customers inside CMS. Um, you know, both in the kind of Medicaid program and policy world, um, the quality space, and in CCSQ, as well as um, at, at CMMI to start to answer these questions. Um, and then, um, it is. Um, I think the, we are, you know, it's just the beginning of the collaboration of, you know, making this data useful for, for states and using it collaboratively. I think there's um, a little bit of fear and hesitation that, uh, about the way CMS will use the data to compare states to one another and, um, and what that's, uh, that's going to look like for them. Um, but I think uh, the, the promise of having this global view and being able to answer some of the really important questions that we've never been able to answer is, you know, is too great to stop, to, you know, stop and not go forward. And then, of course, there's, um, uh, there's a you know, much broader community of, um, of Medicaid stakeholders, researchers, commissions, um, uh, the Congress, of course, who want to use this data to guide their policy making, right? So um, the Medicaid and CHIP payment and um, access commission, uh, they are scrambling to get their hands on them. We had um, uh, we had Ben Summers, who's a, a physician researcher at Harvard, uh, come to speak at our company a couple of months ago, and he told us all about his Medicaid data research, showing the impact of um, the Medicaid expansions on you know all manner of utilization, health outcomes, etc. And none of it actually uses Medicaid data; it's all survey data that's gathered externally. Um, and so it's um, it's really exciting to think about um, how uh, how this data can be used. So let me follow it a little bit different look at it. Um, that all makes sense. I mean, it sounds like it's very early, but they use culture around yep. this. Um, but the history on the other side of Medicare was uh, they've had a warehouse for a long time available, and yet it, it's only so recently that that data can be opened up to use cases for it. I was wondering what your read is on how do the innovation center or other activities may accelerate the use of this data as compared to what happened. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I really have to applaud CMS. They, you know, made some great strides both in terms of you know making public you know public use files available, dashboards that people can access, um, but also in the last say it's like two three years. Um, they've opened up uh, a, a program called the Virtual Research Data Center, which is um, uh, just a, a component of their kind of data provisioning program, right, that enables um, researchers as well as innovators and other stakeholders um, to uh, kind of uh, log in remotely to the claims data repositories and the repositories of other data they have that now contains old Medicaid data, which is only so, so useful, all the Medicare data, the beneficiary surveys, right? And so as soon as the TMC data, as soon as the Medicaid data is deemed ready to go into the research warehouse, it'll be there, which I think will tremendously accelerate um, uh, um, external, uh, external stakeholders, you know, access to that data and the usefulness of that data. The other opportunity I think there still is, um, is with the, quali with the Qualified Entities Program. 
Right? So right now, the Qualified Entities Program provides Medicare data to entities around the country who have non-Medicare data for the purpose of combining it for, um, you know, for performance improvement efforts. And right now, the law allows for, uh, provides the secretary authority to put the Medicaid data in the, um, uh, in, uh, give the Medicaid data to the QEs, but um, so far in the rulemaking, the secretary hasn't yet taken that step. So I think, um, you know, between the, the, VR, the VRDC, the Virtual Research Data Center, and the QE program, it'll, you know, it'll be another big step. Um, but, you know, I think there's still more potential even beyond that to make, um, you know, the process of accessing de-identified data much less onerous, right? I mean, you do want to, um, you know, create the safeguards to um, protect beneficiary privacy, ensure, and, you know, making sure the data is being used in an appropriate way. Um, but there's still, still more that we can I have a question about uh, in building a data warehouse of this magnitude, and, and I know it's not exactly an example down to a small state, but think about data integrity and the resources you need to put against that. Um, and uh, especially when you drill down and you get uh, data that's unidentifiable to the stakeholders, there must be some sort of you know, review process in place, and that just seems daunting in terms of the manual effort. Yeah, for certain. So, I mean, I think there's two, um, uh, there's a couple of different, uh, a couple of different kind of models for, you know, for thinking about that. So, you know, and, and, um, and models that are being used right now in, in Medicare. So through the Qualified Entities Program, which I said, you know, gives Medicare data to combine with other data for the purpose of purpose of uh, performance measurement. CMS actually requires the qualified entities to create a process for you know, for a review and appeal um, of the data. So you know, if a performance score, you're a physician, and a performance score, uh, you know, on a certain quality metric or a cost metric was attributed to you, and you saw and said that doesn't look right, right, that there's a process for dealing with that. Um, at the um, in the um, in the virtual research data center. Um, there's some checks against small numbers, right? So you can't you don't you can't pull out raw data, you know, um, at the um, you know the, where the cell sizes are too small. Again, to ensure that the people using the data are doing analysis on a sufficiently you know a sufficiently large size to provide meaningful meaningful results. Thank you. Thank you. months to know what happened to your, you know, to know whether your patient was admitted to the hospital, right? And in a, um, in, in a, you know, in the, the kind of ideal data world, you have both, right? That the, you know, that there's, the claims data is useful for a lot of different things, for tracking spending, for, um, you know, for kind of population-wide analysis, um, and, um, and the clinical data answers questions that it doesn't, right? So, um, I, I, I uh, put forward this example of the, um, of the Medicaid data warehouse as, a, you know, as um, an example of something that 
uh, you know, a, a, a way to think about how the payer data could be brought together in Delaware, but not for sure, not as a replacement, right, as a, as a supplement to the clinical data. I'll um, pose a question if you don't mind. Uh, so, you know, you're, you've spoken about a very large data warehouse dealing with uh, d uh, claims data received from Medicaid, all states and territories, and then potentially Medicare data as well. So this is a huge data warehouse with claims from um, government-sponsored programs. And that's, that's huge and that's meaningful, but then there's all the commercial plans and there's all the many other sources of relevant data. We've, we've talked over and over about the importance of factoring in social determinants of health and a lot of that data resides in uh, very different data sets. And so uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts about uh, the not yesterday's technology what is the technology that you see that is going to be able to join disparate data sets without individuals having or entities having to give up ownership, if you will, of data that they have gathered, curated for their own purposes, um, and yet the ability for the larger community to share in the value of that data? Sure. Um, so uh, it's a complicated task. Right, and um, <laughs> it is hard um, and, 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 and doable, right? Particularly with, <coughs> excuse me, um, particularly um, with the really broad and forward looking perspective that you're walking into this, you know, right? The, the challenge of incorporating social determinants of health into Medicare data is that the Medicaid da Medicare data warehouses were never built with those things in mind, right? Um, and, um, you know, and in the kind of legacy enterprise data systems, it's so hard to change anything, right? That even if you come to a point and say, well, great, you know, we'd like to bring this in, you know, your, your, your capacity to modify the system that you have um, can be more constrained. So I think, for one, I, I'm not the technology expert. You read my bio, <laughs> right? So, um, so I couldn't say this is the program that you have to use, or this is the approach that you have to use, or the programming language, right? And you know, there's, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's, you know, many, many people around the country who have views about, uh, you know, exactly how to do it from a technical perspective. But I would say more important than anything is coming in with the vision of what you want to accomplish. Right and um, you know and working uh, you know working with um, you know with technologists to help to implement that vision, and then uh, to your second the second part of your question about like how do we kind of make it so that people are just giving up their data, um, right? That uh, you know I think this idea of creating systems that can be resources to the kinds of um, you know to the kinds of um, entities that would be submitting data is also part of that initial vision, right? Is also, you know, so maybe you are getting education data. Um, you know, uh, for example, I, I know Maryland has a program um, in which uh, schools and, um, and pediatricians share information about absenteeism in kids with asthma, right? So that a, a pediatrician can know who among their patients has been missing, you know, multiple days of school? So, you know, as an indication that maybe their um, their asthma medications are well, you know, are 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 controlling the condition well enough, right? And you know, it gets you know it gets complicated and challenging when it comes to privacy and you know how you know but you know how do you you know kind of you you, you want to ensure the integrity of the data and the um, you know the uh, the data user use, using kind of the minimum data necessary to do what they need to do. But I really believe it's about having those conversations early on and by um, you know, talking to stakeholders and saying, like, this is what we need from you. What do you need from us? And how would, you know, how would what we are building here serve your mission, right? To create this global view, you know, this global definition of health like Dr. Brooke talked about, right? And the technology in some ways is the easy part bringing people together, and I really applaud, um, you know, applaud you all for, 
engaging in this process, bringing the people together, having the conversations, right? Getting aligned on a common goal and a commitment to, you know, to working in collaboration with one another to achieve it, right? That, that I think is the hard part. Any other questions before we break for lunch? Um, okay, you go ahead. <laughs> I'll let Dr. Walker announce the lunch. I get to talk about lunch and logistics. Um, so we are going to take a little break. For those of you listening online, tune back in at 12.15. Um, we, are, we have sandwiches in the back of the room. We're going to bring them to the front. OK, bring them to the front. Um, ladies' room is in the back, little boys' room in the front. And um, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them down and pass them to either Dr. Lee or I. Thanks for, for joining us for the morning session.